Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Diversity. I'm Elena Chaniavska. And I'm Gloria Schiavi. This week's top stories are an investigation into the student union elections, the wearable technology fair and protests throughout London. And our first story is demonstrators met in London on Saturday to protest against three elections of Algeria's President Abdulaziz Bouteflako in April. Ida Axling has more on the story. There was singing and chanting when Algerian protesters gathered outside the country's consulate in London. The lively and peaceful protest organized by the Algerian Solidarity Campaign had a clear message. We call for a total boycott of these shameful and fraudulent elections, which are clearly already closed, and whose results will not be decided by the Algerian people, but the dark boxes and shadows of this Algerian regime. People are protesting for more democracy in Algeria, but also against the current president, Bouteflika, who is running for his fourth term. Despite him being ill, he is anticipated to be the winner in this April's elections. 77-year-old President Bouteflika's regime has been in power for 15 years. Protesters and opposition leaders say he is physically and mentally unfit to govern and that the country is more and more ruled by a military elite. In recent weeks, protests have been organized by the Barricade Youth Movement and marches have taken place across the country. International NGOs say that the police have actively tried to keep people out of the streets. There has been many, many arrests, hundreds and hundreds of arrests for women, old people and uh, young men. So there is no freedom of election, of um, expression. Sorry, I'm really excited. These elections, the upcoming elections, the presidential elections, is just another example of how the regime is trying to keep the status quo, how the regime is closing down uh, spaces for freedom of expression. Neighboring countries, Tunisia and Libya, have been affected by uprisings, but Algeria hasn't been a part of the Arab Spring. A conflict 25 years ago led to a civil war that killed more than 150,000 people in the 1990s. This is one of the reasons why many Algerians today are afraid of political instability. What you see in Syria has already be, been uh, produced in Algeria in the 90s, and maybe this has affected a little bit the uh, population that they will see another time this nightmare. Ida Exling, London. Have you been missing out on Japanese music? Yeah, why? Well, our entertainment correspondent Kelly Monaghan knows why. The Irish beer company Guinness withdrew its sponsorship from the New York City St. Patrick's Day Parade on Monday. This was after the organizers said that gays and lesbians were allowed to march in the parade but could not openly identify themselves. Now Guinness released a statement saying that they support diversity and advocate equality for all and that they were disappointed in the organizers. This announcement came just days after Heineken also withdrew from the parade. Music sales have dropped dramatically in Japan, causing a global slump. The International Federation of the Phonographic Industry says there has been a 17% decline in Japanese music consumption. This is dramatic, as Japan is the world's second largest consumer of music. But it's not all bad news for the industry. In Europe, music sales saw its first increase in over 13 years. The Rolling Stones had to postpone their Australia and New Zealand tour after the unexpected news of Mick Jagger's girlfriend's death, Loren Scott. She was found in her apartment on Monday morning after what looked to be an apparent suicide. Mick Jagger is heartbroken, and the Rolling Stones have apologized to their fans in New Zealand and Australia, saying that they appreciate their support during this difficult time. They plan to reschedule their tour as soon as possible. That's all for entertainment this week. Back to you guys. Feminist organization Stop Porn Culture held a conference in London on Saturday. Sex workers and sex activists gathered outside to protest. Pascal Davies has more on the story. You're still trying to push women down when we're trying to think that when we're, in, when we're forward, when we're in control of our lives. Yes, you are. You're trying to push us down because we're, we're using our assets. What's your asset? My body. Sex workers and queers and immigrants together against powerless feminists. The cause of all this noise lies behind these doors where right now a conference is taking place by the organisation Stop Porn Culture and they are arguing that the porn industry is harmful to women. It doesn't just lead to violence against women, it actually is violence against women. So you can see with lots of the gonzo porn, lots of it now that's mainstream, that women are being raped and gagged and abused 
on the porn set. It's, I'm, not, I'm not convinced by the censorship argument. Um, I think that, yeah. I'm not sure that is the route that we're going to go down, but, but absolutely about raising people's awareness and saying it's, 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 it's all about capitalism, it's all about profit, it's the abuse of women purely for profit. But porn activists and sex workers are here to protest their rights to use their bodies as they choose. They claim that uh, pornography is itself wrong and a negative force on society uh, and, and the sex industry as well. We stand here saying we don't believe that. And they also believe that any woman who works in it uh, is a victim of patriarchy and misogyny and that they don't have a real choice to be doing what they're doing. They're just doing it because men have forced them into it. They are slaves, that pornography is itself rape. I'm a full-time male sex worker and there is the impression that we're, we're desperate, we're doing it because we, you know, it's a means to an end, that we need the money and that we're exploited. Uh, the dynamics of the male sex industry is very different to the female side. Uh, the vast majority work completely independently. We don't work for agencies or pimps. And as a full, I'm a full-time male sex worker for nine years. I'm 55. I'm an award-winning escort and I absolutely love my job. David Cameron's war on porn began last year with a proxy, but sex activists are still continuing to put up a fight. Pascal Davies reporting from London. City Students' Union election has been criticised in national and international news once a candidate's homophobic language was discovered on Twitter. The candidate, Hassan Niazi, says there is more to the picture. Catherine Iorio went to investigate. The saying, once it's on the internet, it's there forever, is far too true for one of City University Students' Union election candidates. Hassan Niazi, a postgraduate student in international human rights law, tweeted in February describing a male Pakistani cricket player as a faggot during his campaign. City's new independent media team, The Square, discovered the tweet and broke the story. This one feature created a surge of news coverage from the Evening Standard to The Guardian, then on to an international level with Pakistan's Newsweek publishing a feature. Just like that, Hassan's entire life was under a microscope, bringing his uncle into the picture, Pakistani politician and cricket player Imran Khan. Hassan claims this was a tactful smear campaign carried out by The Square, and he's the victim. First of all, if they have done a smear campaign, um, they were using university's premises, they were using university's wall, they were using the name of the university and according to the union in the response to the, my complaint I sent to them, they said it, it falls under the university's jurisdiction and I believe um, if university can't do anything with them, then I think the university's future rep re reputation is at stake because obviously any student will stand up any day, start a smear campaign against anyone. But the university can't do anything about it. According to one university press officer, the square is an independent media publication and not under the university's jurisdiction. The square's editor, Scott Campbell, claims they were doing their jobs as journalists covering the truth. Um, I think that we reported uh, the facts. Uh, we reported exactly what he tweeted and when he responded we reported his exact response. Um, and therefore, I don't think it's defamatory because it's true. Uh, there's evidence of everything that we have reported, uh, so it, I mean it's, it's definitely not defamatory and it certainly wasn't malicious. With the elections over and the newly elected Students' Union President Rima Amin declared the winner, negativity has swept the campus. I feel like, even on campus now, I feel there's a very negative atmosphere that I haven't felt in the past, um, my, my, my past <laughs> four years being here. I mean, for the past year since I've been VP activities, like I've always walked on campus and um, seen people smiling at me and stuff like that because of the work that I've done. Now it's all very negative and I think a lot of things need clarifying. While Hassan alleges the election process was unfair, the Students' Union released a statement that says, the process was both free and fair. The returning officer received one complaint following the election, which was not upheld. But for Hassan, more needs to be done. But the question is, what I'm expecting from the university and the union is just deal with the smear campaign against me and whatever the conclusion or the judgment they do, 
I'll accept it. Yes, the students who have done this, within university's laws, they should be prosecuted. I don't want this, them to go to the court and, you know, the court settling out the issues. I don't want that to happen. In breaking news yesterday, however, British human rights campaigner Peter Thatchell urges the university to hold a re-election, claiming that he has sympathy with Hassan's complaints over the alleged election procedures, which strikes him as irregular and unfair. For now, those who are involved are waiting to see what happens next. Will a suit be carried out, or will it be brushed under the rug? As the saying goes, time will tell. This has been Catherine Knight Oreo, reporting from London. Hey, don't go too far. Sarachi Rai, our sports correspondent, has the latest news. Beep, beep. Chelsea beat Galatasaray 2-0 at Stamford Bridge, becoming the first English team to proceed into the final eight of the Champions League. They have a tough weekend ahead as they face Arsenal in the epic London clash. The 2014 season kicked off in Australia with Nico Rosberg winning the inaugural race. However, the rookies outshone their more experienced peers, with world champions Lewis Hamilton and Sebastian Vettel failing to finish due to technical difficulties. After a lengthy winter break, MotoGP riders will converge on the desert circuit of Losail in Qatar. That's all from sports. It's back to you. Hundreds of activists marched through the streets of London to Downing Street on this Saturday to mark the third anniversary of the Syrian revolution. They call on the international community to do more to help. Mary Afton Dio has this report. At Mary Afton Dio, we are here with Syrian activists marching to commemorate the third anniversary of the Syrian revolution. Hundreds of people from the Syria Solidarity Movement demanded that British Prime Minister David Cameron allow more refugees into the UK and called for an end to the regime of Bashar al-Assad. He should be stopped and the UN should be doing something to stop. And the rebels are not like only the, the Free Syrian Army. They're all on the ground. They are normal people, just like you and me. They're just people like who just spoken and wanted uh, their voice to be heard. Some activists called on the international community to enforce a no-fly zone over Syria to prevent government air attacks. The EU should move on, um, by bypass the Russian veto and enforce a no-fly zone because people are mostly dying because of bombs, like barrel bombs and Scud missiles and so on. So no-fly zone I think is the only option we have to save lives now. Many British citizens came to express their support and solidarity with the people of Syria and moderate opposition groups. I'm here because I want to show Syrians that I care. Um, that's the main reason I'm here. I think the demonstration can possibly raise a bit more awareness about what's happening and hopefully put pressure on governments and other organizations to actually take action because I think there are things that governments and other organizations could be doing to help the situation. At number 10 Downing Street, five Syrian children delivered a petition urging the government to establish humanitarian corridors to besieged areas such as Aleppo and Homs. Okay, so there's a petition today that we're signing, um, and we've just delivered it to 10 Downing Street. It's to try and put some pressure to open some humanitarian corridors in Syria. So there are some areas in Syria that's under siege, and no water, food, anything is going into those regions. And so we're trying to open some of corridors to enter those areas to provide some aid and basic needs for the people living there. Simultaneous marches were held in Paris, Toulouse, Aleppo, Washington and Rome. Mary of Xandiu, reporting from London. If you don't have it, you must be dreaming of it. The latest technology that you can wear is an exhibit this week in London at the Wearable Technology Show. Alexandra de Bellis got her hands on the gadgets which only existed in sci-fi films before. No. <laughs> One of the hottest new events on the tech calendar is held today at the Olympia Centre in London, where the most prominent producers of wearable technology present their latest devices. The, the main focus, the main interest is all at the moment around your health and well-being. The latest fitness gadget is a small pot that you could wear under your wristband. It keeps you notifications about your calls, your heart rate and can be your GPS transmitter. You can talk Amp Plus to your sports electronics and because they, have, um, they can also talk to each other so you can start to develop ecosystems of, of wearables. Messages of love, friendship and special memories can now be locked into a beautiful piece of jewellery. Integrated chips into it 
that basically mean it connects to your mobile phone. So whoever sent you the card, whoever sent you the I love you message, you get it in glorious Technicolor with the silly, the silly picture or whatever it is. The intelligent handset follows your heart movements, projects them on the screen and provides a revolutionary 3D sound. It is the world's first headset with dynamic 3D audio. When you're wearing the headset and they have, use an app used with the headset, when you hear a sound from, from this direction, when you turn your back to that sound, it will appear from the back. So you basically get this virtual reality uh, sound system around your headset. If you fancy taking a bath with your phone, HZO has the answer with its water block technology. It can be used to make an electronic device water resistant. Customers applied our technology for them to become, you know, from a splash resistant all the way to a swimmable. Now if you are going to jump into the ocean, you can keep them in your pocket. Another trend is the digital highway. Style makes high technology in the Aura new product. It's a full Android system, so um, it's, it's really a standalone, uh, hands-free mobile computing platform. It's about three times the surface area of Google Glass, and it's brighter and it's higher resolution. Um, these lenses here actually, they're not just for show, they're photochromic lenses. So when you go outside they will darken. So I think there's an overwhelming need um, both in industry and eventually in the consumer space for hands-free mobile computing. The event will also host an award ceremony recognizing the UK's leading companies in the sector. More than 400 supporters for Free Tibet gathered this week. They came to commemorate the 55th anniversary since the uprising against the Chinese government. Our reporter Jennifer Chion has more on the story. It's been more than 50 years since the Dalai Lama was forced into exile by the Chinese government. Now, more than 140,000 Tibetans live in exile. Each year, people around the world mark the anniversary with peaceful protests to oppose the violence against the Tibetan community in China. Outside Downing Street, CEO of Tibet Society Philippa Kerik delivered a letter addressed to Prime Minister David Cameron, requesting support for Tibet. The letter also asked that British companies will not be complicit in China's violation of human rights. We just delivered a letter to the Prime Minister um, asking him to meet us so we can discuss Tibet and really calling on him to stand up for Tibetan people's rights. On the way to the Chinese embassy, the Tibetan flag was proudly carried by supporters and the image of the Dalai Lama was ceremoniously held by a monk leading the procession. Once they arrived at the embassy, protesters rallied with emotional speeches and traditional songs. I am Tibetan! I cannot change it! I am what I am! Tibetan! People came to show their solidarity and express their hope for freedom in Tibet. We want to religious freedom, you know? This is very important. Freedom for the Tibetan people to be treated at least as equal to the Chinese who are in Tibet. I think demonstrating here an office support gives us that one step further um, to, you know, makes people more aware of the issues in Tibet. Um, I always have a little bit of hope, but whether we will get independence is, I'm not really 100% sure yet. The coalition of UK-based Tibet groups have tried to reach out to the Chinese ambassador for a dialogue but the Chinese embassy hasn't responded to their request yet. This has not discouraged Tibet supporters and have vowed to continue their protest against the government. Have you heard the craziest, wackiest stories this week? The most incredible and bizarre? The most incredible and bizarre. Our correspondent Mary Axenjiu has the most unusual stories this week. Parents usually tell their kids not to crack walnuts with their teeth because they might break. But what about breaking them with their heads? A martial arts expert has broken a world record by cracking 155 walnuts in just one minute. Mohammed Rashid set the new record at a youth festival in Pakistan. Here's the video. World records, lots of walnuts were broken at the Punjab Youth Festival in Pakistan. <laughs> For this one, martial artist Mohammed Rashid used only his forehead to break open 155 walnuts in one minute. That beats the old record held by an American by an impressive 44 nuts. Live news programs carry their moments of crisis as well. A pair of anchors at KTLA TV had to hide under their desks 
as a 4.4 Richter earthquake hit Los Angeles. They tried to remain calm and followed the duck and cover procedure they've been taught at school. Ginger, thank you. Coming up, more problems for a troubled Earthquake. Yep, We're we having an earthquake. A grandma and her grandson had to be admitted in hospital since they were not feeling well after eating pizza. Mrs. Furley said she was sweating and her heart was beating too fast after eating mushroom pizza. And her grandson had even weirder symptoms. He started talking crazy and ran out of the door naked. When they went to hospital, doctors said there were traces of marijuana intoxication in their urine. Since both of them insist that they haven't smoked weed before the incident, they are now suing the restaurant of putting magic mushrooms in their pizza. That's all from Unusual News. Back to you guys. Thanks for watching this week's episode of Diversity. And don't forget to follow us on the social media outlets. My name is Elena Chenevska. And I'm Gloria Schiavi. See you next week. Beep, beep. Beep.